a warm welcome to this week's episode of our environmental show, Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinobio here in Kampala, Uganda. You do know this show is a co-production of Channels TV in Nigeria, DW in Germany, and TV here in Uganda. But I am not alone. I am with my co-host, Chris Elms. Hello, Chris. Hi, Sandra. A big hello to our viewers from me in Lagos, Nigeria. It's good to have you with us for another edition of our environment show with a focus on Africa. Now here are some topics coming up today. Why microplastics in the world's oceans are making us sick. A new invention that's vacuuming up South Africa's beaches. And a Spanish artist who turns leaves into intricate sculptures. But first, we head to Western Africa where songbirds from Europe like to spend the winter. Now, millions of them migrate to Senegal, Mauritania, and further south through landlocked Burkina Faso. But their habitats are increasingly under threat from intensive farming. Still, a number of conservationists are doing what they can to ensure migratory birds can still find a winter home in sub-Saharan Africa. <music> The fruits of the cordia tree, tamarinds, and a good place for a nest. The biodiversity of trees in Kaboretambi National Park in southern Burkina Faso offers favorable living conditions for many species of birds. Nevertheless, bird conservationists are concerned. Migratory birds from Western Europe, such as the kingfisher, are becoming increasingly rare. Migratory birds are indicators of the health of an environment. Today, we can say there are fewer and fewer migratory birds here, and this is clearly due to the deterioration of the nature of their habitat. Just a few kilometers away from the conservation area, biodiversity is a thing of the past. Only sheer trees, as far as the eye can see. The cosmetics industry task for shear is driving a boom, and farmers like Dennis Nanu are profiting from it. Burkina Faso is the world's second biggest exporter of shear nuts, which are used to make cooking oil and skin products. Shea is very profitable for us. Sometimes I sell nuts, but I earn more with the butter. But awareness is leading to a shift in practices. Now the farmers are starting to restore the destroyed diversity, and that begins with creating healthy soil. Ajuma Sanu works for a Dutch NGO, which is concerned with the survival of migratory birds. He shows the farmers how to make compost from biological waste, including cow dung and maize leaves. The compost is to replace artificial fertilizers which kill insects, an important food source for the birds. Our goal is the protection of birds, but unless the farmers see direct financial benefits, they aren't interested. That's why we work to include business aspects in the project. Maize farmer Frank Nane has already been a composter for some time. I save a lot of money every year on artificial fertilizers, and the field is much more fertile now, and we are all much healthier. The NGO convinced him that it will be better to leave trees standing in his field. He now knows that, in heavy rain, the topsoil doesn't wash away so easily. The roots of the camel's food tree hold the soil well. I used to remove all the bushes and young trees on my fields. Now I practice what is called assisted natural restoration. It's simple. You cut back weak branches to help the stronger ones grow quickly into a tree. Then it can flower for bees and other insects, which will attract birds. More bees, more biodiversity. That's the idea behind NGO Afrique Vats' campaign to teach farmers about keeping bees. Shia farmer Denise Nanu can also earn extra money from that. She already has beekeeping experience, but is happy to have a refresher. 
How does one use a smoker to come bees? When is it time to harvest the honey? Nearly 30,000 farmers have had training in the last year. The first objective is on an environmental level. It's to create biodiversity because bees pollinate fruit trees and trees in general. So this pollination will help the trees and in particular, it will help the shea tree. This year I noticed that the shea tree produced more fruit. Thanks to strong pollination, I'm really happy to have the bees. Although people will continue to plant shea trees, in the future, they are more likely to leave other trees standing as well, allowing more nature to develop and thrive. It's a prediction we keep hearing, and it's shocking every time. Experts have calculated that by 2050, plastic in the oceans will outweigh fish. That is correct, Chris. It is a horrifying prospect, and as if the effects of plastic debris on marine life weren't bad enough, some researchers in the UK are looking into the impact that microplastics could already be having on our own health. Let's take a look. What's on the menu? Plastic pasta? Bottle cap dim sums? Or maybe some Lego sushi? Sounds strange, but that is roughly equivalent to the amount of microscopic pieces of plastic that we ingest over the course of a month. 20 kilograms over the course of a lifetime. We do this by simply breathing air, drinking water and eating fish. The oceans and rivers in particular are full of microplastics, says Malcolm Hudson. A professor of environmental science, he conducts research on marine pollution from plastic particles. Those plastic particles, if you like, are little time bombs waiting to break down small enough to be absorbed by wildlife or by people and then potentially have harmful consequences. Because plastic does not biodegrade, it ends up everywhere, flooding the beaches and choking marine fauna and flora. Plastic production has risen sharply over the past 50 years. There are now over 400 million tonnes worldwide per year. Smaller and smaller particles are created by wind and waves, friction and sunlight. They're so small that they could be absorbed into our blood through the stomach. Researchers see this as a danger to humans. Experiments with cell cultures have already shown that large amounts of nanoparticles can be toxic. What we can say, I think, with some certainty is if we carry on at the moment, as we're going, producing more and more plastic, not managing the waste very well, eventually we'll reach levels where there are thresholds exceeded and there are harmful effects on the environment and potentially even on ourselves. The total impact on humans is not yet clear. Experts fear that the tiny particles could trigger immune reactions or release toxic substances into the body. Just one more good argument to put an end to our love affair with plastic. That all sounds very worrying. Plastic can really mess up our world. It is bad for the animals and for us. But I'm scared. We won't be getting rid of it anytime soon. Fortunately, there are lots of people coming up with interesting solutions to tackle the problem. One of them comes from South Africa and it is a pretty cool idea. It is an original way of getting rid of the microplastics in waterways and on beaches. There's nothing this nozzle can't guzzle up. No item of plastic can escape the jaws of this giant vacuum cleaner. Chris Krauss is using what's called the Enviro Buggy to collect rubbish littering Cape Town's beaches. The conservationist works with the organization See the Bigger Picture, which developed the prototype a couple of years ago. Every year, an estimated 100,000 tons of plastic are found on South Africa's many beaches. That's a lot to clean up. According to Chris Krauss, the beach cleaner can even suck up plastic particles just one millimeter small. A special sieve system separates the sand from the plastic. Even with 100 people on the beach, we weren't really making, we weren't making as much of an impact as we could regarding the microplastics. So this came about trying to make that microplastic collection a lot more efficient and quicker. 
Kraus and his NGO recently joined forces with a local recycling company on the outskirts of Cape Town. The employees sought out various items into recyclable material. Some 20 people are on shift every day. Even rubbish not classified as recyclable can be put to good use. This is an eco brick here. So it's all the plastics that cannot be uh, reused or repurposed or recycled go into one of these. They are compressed as best they can and uh, used as a building material in local uh, building projects and around the community. Other initiatives start at an earlier stage. They concentrate on rivers. The community of Marina da Gama has funded a series of nets with different sizes to catch plastic along waterways before it gets to the ocean. Peter Ryan, a marine plastic researcher at the University of Cape Town, estimates that between 60% and 90% of marine plastic on the beaches has arrived via waterways like this one. Just standing here, we can see all of this rubbish coming down the canal here. This is the major source of litter that we're concerned about in an urban setting in South Africa. So it's poorly managed waste on land, getting into wastewater systems and being carried down into the sea. And initiatives like this, where we're actually intercepting this litter before it gets into the sea, are starting to make a significant difference. Farther north, in the township outside Johannesburg, these volunteers are unemployed locals. They're removing plastic waste from litter traps positioned in the Henops River. The man in charge explains that mountains of plastic can accumulate in the space of just two weeks. We started to put the nets up in the, at the beginning of the rainy season to try and stop this huge avalanche. Um, it seems like in the winter a lot of stuff gets um, informal dumps in the townships and stuff, so all of that stuff gets washed down in the rainy season. So it keeps on the whole summer, but I think the, the worst stuff is in the beginning, so we're trying to, um, to stop it here. Not only is the NGO working to rid the hen ups of waste, it is looking into some of the main contributors of the pollution. Back at the ocean, the initiative See the Bigger Picture encourages young people to get involved. Studies in South Africa have shown that on a clean-up day, nearly 90% of the plastic littering the beaches can be collected. Still, even that is only a first step. Once we can teach them the dangers of marine plastics, they will take better care of where they live and we'll try to stop that spread at the source. So instead of throwing things on the road or outside on the beach, we'll actually teach them how to dispose of everything properly. Chris Krause and his team are currently operating the Enviro buggy. It can already do the work of about 30 people. The plan is to start mass producing the machine and ultimately return South Africa's beaches to their once pristine condition. Wow, those images remind us that we really need to keep up with the fight against plastic pollution. We all tend to throw away far too much stuff that can actually be recycled. You are absolutely right, Sandra. And Carlos Silva from Cape Verde knows it too. He's come up with a clever way of reusing cooking oil. In Cape Verde, one entrepreneur is seeking to clean up the environment, one bar of soap at a time. Terra Verde is an ecological soap, which Carlos Silva makes using vegetable oils, green clay, flour and other ingredients. He tries to source most of the ingredients locally. Eight years ago, I started out producing soap from cooking oil. It could be used to wash dishes. Then later, I began making this eco-soap for people to use in the shower. Silva's desire to help the environment motivated the move to producing ecologically sustainable cosmetic products. Everything we use ends up in the sewer, which will then contaminate the rivers, oceans and our groundwater. Silva has now automated parts of the production process. 
Even the machines he uses are made from recycled materials. He can now produce more bars in much less time. It used to take me eight hours to make a batch, now it's only three. A lot of the steps are automated now. Carlos Silva hopes to sell his Terra Vede soap on the international market soon. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Our next report comes from Spain. There, Lorenzo Manuel Duran creates delicate sculptures that combine his passion for arts and nature. Now, he loves to take walks, and that's when he collects the materials that serve as his canvas. He turns them into intricate pieces of art that express his love of nature. Now, sit back and let yourself be inspired. There's so much to discover in a single tiny leaf. These filigree masterpieces were handmade by Spanish artist Lorenzo Manuel Duran. He cut them into leaves harvested from trees and bushes. When I'm in the bosque, eh... When I go into the forest, more than anything, I'm looking for peace and quiet. This is where my creativity really gets flowing. Every year in spring, Lorenzo Manuel Duran goes searching through the forests of his home province, Guadalajara, for just the right leaves. I think the perfect leaf doesn't exist. The perfect leaf doesn't exist. Leaves grow in nature, and they've undergone a process of evolution. But it's precisely their imperfection that, in my view, makes them perfect. These works give little hint of the time, effort, and dedication that's gone into them. Duran presses the fresh leaves and lets them dry for a few days. The leaves have to be dry enough that cuts don't smear or discolor, and yet moist enough not to crumble. The image stencil is attached to the leaf with fixative. Then he carefully works his way around with a scalpel, cut by cut. I was inspired when I watched a caterpillar eating its way through a leaf. That gave me the idea to cut my own designs into leaves. Over time, I learned more and more and developed my own technique. Depending on the design, it can take Lorenzo Duran several days to finish the cutting. He enjoys the almost meditative work. For him, his art has been a journey of self-exploration. One side of a leaf is turned to the light, the other stays in shade. There's a similarity there to us humans. One side of us is visible, the other is not. When I work on a leaf, I'm in touch with a side of me that isn't visible. His works are also in demand with companies for green media campaigns. Leaves cleanse the air of carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, making them an ideal symbol for a healthy environment. For Duran, sustainability and green ethics are very important. What I want to express is the human being's original bond with nature. Today, we've lost this sense of connection. It's only if we humans manage to see ourselves as a part of nature that we can learn to respect our environment again. If they're carefully preserved, his artworks can survive 10 years or more. But like nature itself, they too are transitory. There is no mistake in the artist's message. Nature's beauty has to be preserved. 
which is also the theme of our next report that comes from Kenya. Exactly, Chris. It is about the rewards of looking after our environment. The Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, for example, takes a community-based approach to conservation and it is paying off for both the local people and the local wildlife. The Lewa Wildlife Conservancy in central Kenya is a paradise for animals and animal lovers. The 250 square kilometers are home to thousands of giraffes, elephants, lions, rhinos, and many other species. The land used to be part of a cattle ranch owned by a British farmer. In the 1980s, when poaching was decimating the black rhino population, the family turned the land into a sanctuary. Today, around 170 black rhino live in the conservancy. They're protected by 123 rangers, a pack of specially trained dogs, and a high-tech surveillance system. Most of the rangers are locals. The Lewa Conservancy says that working closely with local communities is an effective strategy in the fight against poachers. Communities, they are playing a critical role in terms of conservation. Without really putting them in board, you are not winning in terms of conservation. And that's why now we are focusing in terms of putting a lot of programs outside the community so we can really win the community to get a lot of information and at least they can be eyes and ears of us. If the local people notice anything suspicious, they report it to the ranger Purity Wamuyu. She grew up here and knows almost everybody in the area. Right now we are five female rangers at the moment. I was the first to be employed. I was employed in 2012. This conservancy means everything to me. The Lewa Wildlife Conservancy invests about 70% of its earnings in programs benefiting local communities. Pauline Karambu owns a small farm, but for many years lacked financial resources. But in 2017, a Lewa Conservancy program helped her secure a microcredit. I did a lot with the money. I bought seeds to plant onions. I also bought two pigs. There are many benefits. For example, they bring in trainers who teach us about many issues that have to do with health and how we can help ourselves as women. Eighteen hundred women have so far received microcredits. There are also classes on business, the environment and practical skills. Previously, women have been so disadvantaged in terms of accessing capital, in terms of engaging businesses. That's why we engage with the women around the conservancy, so that they can realize that potential that they have. We come to their farms or the groups where they meet, we do trainings, we link up with the maybe specialists, technical experts, agro dealers, so that these farmers can benefit with the best knowledge and taking techniques for farming and producing for, for consumption and for the market. The programs have helped improve the standard of living in neighboring communities. Working closely with the local government, the Conservancy supports four clinics and runs one of its own. Local people receive free medical care, including medicine and vaccines. The aim uh, of setting up this uh, clinic was to provide much needed uh, primary health care services to um, communities that live around the conservancy. Monthly, this clinic alone serves around 800 uh, people. The efforts made by the Lewa Wildlife Conservancy, not only to protect wild animals, but also to support local communities, have found international recognition. Since 2014, it's been included in the prestigious IUCN Green List of protected areas. The seal of approval is a huge boost to the project. It helps us in terms of our marketing strategies. It helps, helps us in terms of our fundraising. And it help, helps us so that we can be a model uh, for others to emulate, for others to come and learn from us. What we are doing here on Lewa, it's not for Lewa. It's for the Kenyan heritage. It's for the global heritage. It's for the community heritage. The Lewa Wildlife Conservancy shows that protecting wildlife is compatible with the needs of local communities, 
With the right strategies, both can flourish side by side. What a great initiative. Hopefully it will inspire you and others to take responsibility of the environment too. We now come to the end of this week's episode of Eco Africa and we look forward to having your company again next week. I am Sandra Twinobia signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. Bye Sandra. In the meantime, you can stay in touch with us on social media, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Stay safe, be mindful of others and see you soon. I am Christy Lemps signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. <music>